Good evening and welcome. My name is Peter Capelli. I'm a professor at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. It's a pleasure to have all you with us uh, tonight for our open forum. The topic tonight is unemployment, uh, and we're going to talk about many of the issues around it. Uh, just to set a little bit of context, at the moment the estimates suggest that there are 200 million people worldwide unemployed. Uh, the current economic downturn driven by the financial crisis from a few years ago, some people estimate have pushed 300 million individuals into poverty worldwide. Unemployment is 48 million in the OECD countries right now. Uh, in places like Spain, it's 50%, um, or 25%, sorry. Youth unemployment, especially high. In places like Spain, it's now 56% of youth are unemployed. And you go around the world, you can see similar statistics. Uh, the effects we know of unemployment uh, are very severe on health, on people who are starting out, delays in terms of getting your life uh, going and organized. Uh, deprivation of all kinds. It's a terrible thing. If this had been a national or natural disaster, it would have been of unprecedented magnitude to do this much damage so quickly. So uh, that's the context. It's not just a OECD problem. If you travel to the developing world, you see similar problems. In a country like China or India, every percentage point unemployment is equivalent to about 8 million people. So it's a very big problem worldwide. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that today with our panel and uh, I think working uh, from this side, from my far right, Jamie McCullough, who's the CEO of uh, Education for Job Training, or, or ed sorry, Education for uh, Employment, which is a job training and economic development program uh, based in the Middle East and uh, North African countries. Um, next, uh, Next to Jamie is Chris uh, Gopala uh, Krishna, the co-founder and executive co-chair of Emphasis, one of the world's leading information technology companies. Uh, and next uh, to my right is Sharon Burrow, general secretary of the International Trade Union Confederation Congress. Confederation, sorry. Uh, the international group representing trade unions and trade union members worldwide. Uh, to my left is Mr. Frederick Reinfeld, who is prime minister of Sweden. Simple job description there. Yeah. Uh, no need to say more. Uh, to his left is the Director General of the ILO, Mr. Guy Ryder, international uh, agency in charge of uh, examining and reporting on what's going on in the workplace around the world. Uh, and last on our left is uh, Nafez al Dakak. Did I get that right? Dakak, good. Uh, who's a strategic planning officer at the Queen uh, Rania for Education Development Foundation in Jordan. Uh, we're going to open it up for conversation and questions from the audience in just a bit, but before then we're going to have a little discussion up here and we've asked uh, uh, the first question maybe to go to Nafez and uh, Nafez is the least senior in terms of age person on the panel and has recently been hunting for a job himself, so I thought maybe we could put a human face on this by asking him what his experience was like, and Hafez is a graduate of Yale University, which I understand is a good place. Uh, so, uh, should have been easy, right? What, what did you experience? Well, what happened? Yeah. So, I guess to start with unemployment, given the statistics you raised and a lot we heard about, is a very personal issue for this generation. And it's, I guess to put it briefly, is probably one of the most humbling experiences most people go through, right? And I guess that's for multiple reasons. One. Uh, to start with me, I had to go through 25 job applications to land two jobs, right? And I graduated Yale, so I'm, I'd argue maybe not the typical graduate. So if it took me 25 jobs, uh, 25 job applications to add two jobs, and that's not even counting the number of interviews, right? So it's a very long process. And I think there may be three problems that I experienced. One, the job search is very confusing, right? N nobody's really sure what employers want 100%. I try to help a lot of people younger than me with this now, and nobody knows, do they want a one-page resume? Is it a two-page resume if I'm applying to a UK company? And what goes around that? Second, I guess it's very frustrating because, um, and I remember this clearly, being uh, going to school and doing interviews at the same time, because you feel there's a clear mismatch between what you're learning sometimes and what the employers are asking of you, and maybe they're asking too much of you. Yeah. And I specifically remember going to the dean of uh, my school and saying, listen, I have two finals tomorrow but I have a job interview after that. I think I'm gonna forget the finals because once I graduate school, it's whether I'm employed or not, that's the whole purpose of this thing. And I think maybe the biggest uh, issue with all this is it's a really demoralizing process. And I'd like to quote a friend who, 
again, graduated Yale and now is doing ma her master's at MIT. So a quite accomplished, very smart young girl. And I was asking her, what is she about to do? What is she looking forward after graduation? And this is what she said. She said, I'm scared of jobs. I'm scared of jobs because after my last experience, it was the first time I felt I had to work so hard for things and failed so much. It's just so weird that after such a great education, employment is so hard. I really don't understand what I'm doing wrong. And I guess there's a big need here around maybe mentorship and guidance towards uh, employment to work, trans uh, education to employment transitions. And it's something I'm, I guess I'm glad to say that the youth have really noticed. If you look at the Global Shaper Hubs from Charlotte to Kiev to Joburg to Dubai to Kuala Lumpur, most of the hubs, and if people are not familiar with the Global Shapers program, it's a program that bring by the WEF, initiative that brings young people together that are passionate about their societies and their employment. So most of their first projects have been around mentoring youth and helping them find jobs, whether it's at the high school level, whether it's at the university level. Mm -hmm. yeah, good. Uh, maybe for a, a little bit of an overview of what's going on, we could ask uh, Guy Ryder to tell us a little bit about how things look and you know, why we aren't maybe making faster progress on this. Certainly it's a different story depending where you are in the world, what's happening there, but is there a simple, or could you tell us a simple sort of story about how things stand and why we're not moving faster and creating new jobs? Yeah, well, thanks very much. I, I'm helped uh, in, in the few words I'm going to say by uh, what Nafez has just reminded us all of, uh, which is the reality of the experience of unemployment, which I think should be very present in the minds of us all. The experience of being unemployed for young people, uh, I've heard it described, and that quote you've given illustrates it to perfection is that the experience of being unemployed, particularly at the beginning of your professional life, but not only that, is an experience of learned hopelessness. It's demoralizing. It actually diminishes you as a person and your potential for the future. Now, what are the numbers? The numbers are extremely bad. Uh, you know, when some of the messages that I suspect and in some ways hope that Davos will be projecting are that we are over the worst of the crisis. Things are getting better. Global unemployment continues to get worse. Um, after two years of some improvement, uh, the ILO's figures just published show that in 2012, 4.2 million were added to the global unemployment figures, and that that trend uh, looks set to continue in the two coming years. So I think and I hope that Davos will focus on that, uh, that reality. Um, uh, obviously, the advanced world is feeling the brunt of these, uh, these negative developments, but it is a global phenomenon. It is a global phenomenon, and I think that the transmission belts of unemployment from the epicenter countries of the crisis is being felt in development uh, processes uh, more generally. Now, why uh, is getting back to something approaching full or acceptable uh, levels of, of employment apparently eluding policymakers nationally and internationally? Uh, it, it's a question that we really need to, I think, focus on a little bit more clearly. There is a, a, a line of thought, I think, which is that the global economy has now changed, is of a different nature than it was perhaps at the time when countries could easily subscribe to full employment as uh, a consensus-based uh, priority uh, for national policy and international policy making. We know that globalization has complicated labor market dynamics. We know the effects of technology. We're aware of the polarization of skills profiles in demand. We're aware of the mismatch of uh, skills uh, which are being produced by the educational system uh, and those uh, which are in demand from a rapidly evolving economy. All of those are realities. All of those are policy challenges that we need to address. Uh, and yet we're failing badly, I think, to do so uh, in any way which is commensurate with the size and gravity uh, of the problem. Uh, I think we have to um, look at our um, skills mismatches. Uh, the figures are there, the evidence is there, but why is it wrong? Uh, uh, do we simply point the finger at an educational system which is failing young people? Or do we look also at the behavior of enterprises and the actors on the labor markets? I sometimes get the impression uh, that employers, and they're in a position to be extremely demanding uh, in, in current labor market conditions. I mean, when you've got 2,500 applicants for a job, you can afford to look for the perfect product. Uh, but does that mean that industry employers are actually uh, stepping back from what I think should be one of their responsibilities, 
which is to help us out. You know, do they want the complete product coming onto the labour market, out of school, out of university, or do they have a responsibility in a part, through apprenticeships, through investing in their workforce, and one has to wonder if the contractual um, commitment between enterprises and their workforces are what they used to be. And are they playing up to their full role? And if not, how can government play its role in getting them back into the frame? Mm -hmm. I also think that the youth uh, employment, there, there are two things that I think we need to focus, and I'll close with this very closely on. One, of course, is the drama of youth unemployment, uh, particularly in Europe, but not exclusively in Europe. I'm sitting next to the Prime Minister of a country which has a great record with youth employment guarantees, with youth guarantees. Uh, now, if a young person's out of work for a certain period of time, is it beyond our capacities in Europe to offer them an opportunity at a job at further education? It requires an investment, but the cost of doing nothing in terms of lost production, uh, in terms of social benefits payable to those people, well, the cost of doing nothing is much greater than investment required. And the second, and I'll finish with this, is long-term unemployment. The point at which the notion of employability uh, becomes an issue. When you're out of a labour market for a year, well, that learned hopelessness begins to affect your, uh, your attitude towards work and labour markets. We have to stop that happening. Mm -hmm. One third of young people in Europe who are unemployed have been out of a job for more than six months. So that lost generation is in formation right now and we have to stop it from going further. Mm -hmm. uh, sure, enough as I was saying uh, before, that the evidence is pretty clear. This problem is terrible. Guy just reminded us how bad it is. I know you and your uh, organization and its members are spending a lot of time in the political process to try to elevate uh, the issue. Why aren't we making more progress on the political side? I mean, what's the politics of this problem? Well, there's a crisis in political <coughs> leadership. And uh, while I might uh, compliment Sweden in a moment, because they're the one country that stands out as having a commitment with the unions to full employment. Nevertheless, if you look around the world, you can find maybe four or five countries where there's serious scaling up of apprenticeships, where there's investment in jobs. And we know, remember, we know how we built economies. The evidence is in. We actually invested in infrastructure, particularly uh, nationwide infrastructure, transport, telecommunications, uh, you know, industry policy, innovation, R&D. Remember the debates we used to have about how to actually scale up different sectors at which countries had uh, particular competitive advantage. None of those conversations are going on. Social dialogue has all but disappeared, except in a handful of countries where business, unions and government are saying, how do we fix the problem? And part of it, I hate to say, is because many governments have simply lost both their moral authority when they wake up every morning more worried about what the stock market is doing than whether their people can eat, whether they have a job, whether their school systems or their health systems are supporting people. And they've lost their democratic authority when, in fact, the Troika or any, some other institutional setting, the marriage of the bond markets and the ratings agencies, are dictating their response. So, you know, I've characterised the record here as play it again, Sam. You hear the same things, the same things. And yet, when we were in Tokyo with the IMF meetings in, uh, I think it was about October, September, I, uh, I, I felt a moment of optimism, just a moment of optimism, when the chief economist had the courage to say they got the multiplier impact wrong. He didn't say we got the policies wrong, but that's what they meant. The negative impact of austerity without a growth plan, without jobs, none of us in the union movement would say you don't need fiscal consolidation from time to time. But we all know Economics 101, pro-cyclical measures where you simply make victims of working people and their families, you attack labour rights, etc. That's driven the economies of Europe into recession. So let me say this one more time. If we don't learn from our history, if somehow the orthodoxy of failed economic policy, characterise it as you will, the Washington consensus, the speculative greed, whatever it is, if you don't learn that we built economies together, we invested together, 
If you go back to Sweden, they put social protection in place in the 1890s in countries like mine, this one, others. They were post-depression World War II settlement. That gave us social and economic stability. But guys lost generation, the, the young people, that's a social and economic time bomb. We're seeing a rise in organised crime. We're seeing a rise in domestic violence out of desperation. Young people and women pushed into the informal sector. We can fix this. In fact, the business community with uh, Guy Ryder's uh, leadership this year will have a discussion about how to formalise jobs. But frankly, the answer is employment. It's jobs, jobs and jobs. That will drive growth, not the other way around. And until governments stand up and have the courage to say full employment matters, our young people matter, let's scale up inclusion in the labour market, even as we drive jobs, whether it's in the care economy, in the green economy, we've all done the research. We can tell you what investment will drive. And we have a stake in this. We have $25 trillion of workers' capital, pension money, invested in the global economy. We want it out of the speculative environment into the real economy, and we want governments to sit down and look with us about what it will take to drive the confidence that is about responsible return, long-term responsible return, not the speculative greed. I'll leave you with two figures, if I can. One is $240 billion was added by the wealthiest 100 last year. You know what that would pay for? Social protection floor for the 50 poorest countries. There's $21 trillion in uh, tax havens offshore. So where's the courage of governments to end extreme wealth and make people pay a fair share? And finally, if we just gave people an income rise, you might kickstart demand. And when there's $6 trillion on corporate balance books, then we know the solutions are there, but the political courage is not. Just briefly, which of the countries that you think really are making progress on this, having good dialogue? Okay, well, I can tell you that, uh, we can tell you from our global poll, okay. actually. If you look at the optimism in the global poll, you won't find it in many places. This, this has uh, a, a statistic in here that's frightening. When overwhelmingly, <coughs> People say the next generation will be worse off. People are saying their children, their grandchildren, will be worse off. Where are you bucking the trend a little on that? Brazil, emerging economy, deliberate policies with uh, inclusion both from growth and social protection at the same time. In Australia, my own country, the, the, uh, the unemployment question has always been on the agenda. We have a robust apprenticeship system a robust skills system that attempts to try and match those uh, skills mismatches, but we have investment in jobs. Australian government got criticised for actually making public investment in broadband, the future transmission belts of, uh, of our economy, but it's working. So I'm quite proud of, of, of my own country. In parts of Europe, in Scandinavia, Nordic countries, the dialogue is still there. It's a bit fractured but the dialogue is still there. But, like I said, you can count them on your fingers, and that's the tragedy, because wherever you go in the world, whether it's conflict, whether it's uh, you know, unacceptable conditionality, whatever it is, governments have lost their courage to stand up and say, let's sit down and figure this out. And I would say the G20 is failing us, because you know, in London and Pittsburgh, we knew that they cared about jobs. They were right up there, front and centre. Income-led growth, jobs at the heart of recovery. Toronto, we saw the orthodoxy of austerity with no plan for jobs hit, and that's what's been driving us since. Uh, Chris, maybe we could ask you to say just a little bit about what's happening in India, obviously a different economic context, and now one where India is doing better than the... Uh, rest of the, uh, the OECD countries in Europe in particular, but also could you say a little about the role of employers as you see this in this context? Sure. So clearly every country has its own problems and challenges and a, you know, a, a country with large population like India, um, which is um, in the path to um, industrialization actually, um, has its own challenges and problems. 
Uh, first and foremost, 70% of the population is dependent on agriculture still. And as the economy um, grows, as um, uh, the standard of living increases, less and less number of people are going to de depend on agriculture. That means more than 700 million people will have to be moved from agriculture to some other um, sector. Uh, these are people who have very uh, low level of education or sometimes no education. You know, illiteracy is still 30%. Uh, that's one problem. The second problem is underemployment. So even if you have people who have some education, there's a mismatch between education and what jobs are being created today. Um, even though the per capita income is still about $1,500, India has actually um, become a services economy today. 50, more than 50% of the GDP is actually from the services sector. Um, so for a developing country to s depend so much on services is very unique, actually. And, and to be employed in the services sector, uh, you really need um, you know, a good education, you need soft skills training and things like that. So there is a mismatch between the, the education, what the education they get and what jobs are being created today. So there's an un underemployment issue and a skills gap issue. Uh, this is being recognized by the government. So the government has launched one of the largest um, skilling programs, I believe. Uh, their target is by 2020 to retrain 500 million people. Uh, it's one of the largest. And also, uh, today, 17% of the economy consists of manufacturing. They want to take it to 24% of the economy so that they can create manufacturing jobs. So that's from an India perspective. Um, <coughs> The IT sector in India uh, has benefited from globalization, has created significant number of jobs. It's one of the uh, show pieces uh, of liberalization, show pieces of uh, uh, people moving into middle class, etc. In the last uh, 20 years, uh, the IT sector has created about 2.5 million jobs. And these jobs were created by the sector itself investing in education and training. Uh, so rather than wait for the university system to produce the graduates that are required for the growth of the industry, the industry invested and created a finishing school. Most companies in India have that. I reinforces, you know, we can train on any given day 14,000 people. We have created a very large capacity to train and, um, and, and, and this training is not trivial. Uh, in our case, the entry-level training program is six months. That means after an engineering degree, a person joining the company goes through another six months training to actually um, start on a project, to start on a, a job. So the industry has created these employable people. Further, the industry also has created a continuing education program and the business model includes this continuing education expense. It's built into the business model. Uh, in an industry that is fast changing, technology is fast changing, this is again very, very important because you have to retain your employees and you have to retrain your employees in a fast changing uh, industry like ours. The challenge has been that you know, we are impacted by business cycles. And for example, today, you know, our utilization rates are very low because the global economy is going through a slow period and we have significant number of people on what we call bench or unutilized capacity. But we are retaining them, we are, um, you know, giving them additional training and, and, and we, we are confident that in the future we'll be able to use them as growth comes back and things like that. Chris, so, sorry, Chris, could I just, uh, I'm not sure everybody quite gets that. So you, you didn't lay anybody off in the down We did not lay anybody okay. off. Um, okay. We said that, uh, no, of course, you know, every company looks at performance and let's go people, but we said if your performance is good, you continue to and no layoff at all, mm -hmm. you know, based on, um, you know, based on, you know, a, a slowdown in the business and things like that. And we retain those employees and it's a large number, 18,000 people. 
large number. So we, we are retaining them and we are continuing to train them and, and they are getting deployed as and when opportunity arises. So I strongly believe that um, you know, to address these complex issues today, it has to be a partnership between government, academic institutions and industry. The government has a role to play in looking at forecasting what kind of jobs would be created, working in looking at what industries will provide the jobs that are required based on the strengths of the country, based on the environment in which you know, the, the, the country is, uh, the competitiveness of the country. Uh, they also need to look at funding. You, know, you talked about you know, the Nordic countries. You know, in the Nordic countries, there is special funding the government provides to businesses to retain people, etc. cetera. Uh, academic institutions will have to stay current, will have to be flexible, and, and, and that is a challenge today. Um, and also continuously interact with the industry to understand what the industry is looking for, uh, you know, what skills are they looking for, et cetera. And the industry has the responsibility to make sure that um, you know, they provide all the information, they provide the forecast, they also fund part of the training on an ongoing basis so that um, you know, they get a continuous supply of um, people. So this has to be a a win-win-win kind of situation, a resp joint responsibility for all the people concerned. Good. Uh, Jamie, you're the person here who is closest to sort of on the ground trying to get people jobs, and especially youth, and probably especially people who we wouldn't think of as being particularly advantaged in finding jobs. And you, I know you've done some of this in the U.S., but particularly in the Middle East, North Africa. Is there a common theme to what um, is missing that's making it difficult for these folks to be employable, and particularly in the area you're working now, is there something specific there? Yes, um, so first I wanna say, you could all leave this room incredibly depressed <laughs> based on the statistics and the comments of my fellow panelists, and it, it is a truly global crisis we're dealing with. Um, but I'd like to try to shine a little light and a little hope into this conversation, because I think there are also some really powerful examples of things that are working. Um, you mentioned Australia, we'll talk about other exam country examples, but there are also models that are working. We think we have one that's working at a small scale and we'd like to, to scale up. And um, as part of the uh, Global Agenda Council on Youth Unemployment, we're trying to um, position other approaches that have worked in different geographies to showcase the models that really need to be adopted by policymakers, government, business, and um, educational institutions. My organization uh, called Education for Employment is called that for a reason, because in the region we work, a lot of uh, young people are coming out of school um, and they're getting education uh, for unemployment, right? So they're getting a lot of education, they're getting degrees, they're graduating from high school, from university. Um, the region has invested in a lot of uh, publicly subsidized education all the way through university, which is a great thing, but the quality of the, the education is not where it should be. The degrees that people are getting are not relevant in the job market. And Education for Employment was designed to bridge that gap. I often say that in a way we should be putting ourselves out of business because we're plugging a gap um, to try to make these systems work a little better. We basically are doing three things. We're partnering with businesses to help identify the skills that entry level employees need. And then we're re-engineering the skills to make sure that young graduates can be skilled up in a short period of time, placed in jobs, and uh, retained in jobs for at least a year or more, at least get that, that first job and that first experience to get their life on track. We ask businesses to identify the skills, to commit to hiring our graduates, um, and to pay a little bit, but we're essentially bringing subsidized training um, with job commitments um, to these markets. It's worked, as I said, on a small scale. We're now up to training and placing about 3,000 young people uh, across six countries in the Middle East and North Africa. Jimmy, can I just stop you? And, yeah. and could you tell us a little about what the skills are that sure. these folks don't have that keep them out of the labor market until you train them? It's, it's actually two things for us. It's skills and access. So as Naf has pointed out, we don't have a lot of Yale University graduates in the region. Most of our uh, graduates are coming from institutions that frankly, the private sector thinks are, are not um, of quality and will not 
on paper look at graduates that come from these institutions. So we're also trying to provide access to employers. But what we really focus on is these soft skills that everybody talks about. The, the, the saying that you know, businesses hire for technical skills but fire for soft skills <laughs> is what we focus on. We're focusing first on the soft skills. We are getting young people who've never been exposed to the world of work, getting them into simulated work environments, very practical, hands-on training experiences, internships for one or two weeks on the, um, on the job to get a first exposure to the, to the job before they actually get the job, and then support, mentoring. Um, we have a whole alumni program to provide support once they're on the job, because as many of you know, it's not enough to just get the job the first time your boss yells at you, you want to quit. And we want to have somebody there that they can call and, and ask advice. So you've, you've got to have that, that long-term support. And I'd just like to ask a question of the audience, because uh, this is something that I try to ask when I go around the region. How many of you started your first job with a low-skill, low-wage job? Well, I personally did. You know, I, my first job was as a busboy, you know, bussing dishes. And one of the things I'm always um, struck by in the region that we work in is that so many young people have such high expectations for their first job because their family and they invested the time and energy in getting a degree, which is understandable. But I always try to urge people to at least take that first step, get that first job experience, get some, something under your belt, something on your resume that other employers c will recognize as basic job experience. And that's one of the other things we're dealing with, at least in our region, is that sometimes young people are putting up their own barriers to getting into the labor market. And we're trying to change attitudes in that respect as well. Good. While we're doing an audience poll, maybe I could ask a quick one. How many of you have an immediate family member, which might include yourself, uh, who is out of work right now? Just want to see how extensive it is. So, um, that, that includes me. I have an unemployed son. The, Spanish apparently have a great uh, new expression for this among youth unemployment, uh, ninas, not in school, not in employment. Um, and I've, I've got one of those home as well. Um, Mr. Prime Minister, I'm sure people ask you this all the time, why aren't you fixing the problem? Um, <laughs> what is it that is the hardest part? I mean, I'm sure you have the, the interest in doing it. What is the hardest part for a government in terms of trying to make progress on this? What are, what are the roadblocks? I think job creation is the most important question, but I think employability in our time is probably the toughest case to solve. Um, let's be honest, when we listen to India, uh, and I compare with Sweden, we used to have people in the, in the farmers, um, in, in the countryside, 150 years ago. We used to have people in the industry, but they are basically gone. So, where are they? Well, that's the question. Uh, they are very much in the now um, booming private service sector with high-skilled jobs. But, and this is the problem, it's very clear that uh, what the employers are asking in quality and experience have risen enormously. Uh, so it's not that much of a difference, the young people coming out of schools. I would say that they're even better, better educated. They know more about the world now, the youngsters, than I did and the generation before me. But you have never seen anything like what we have in the labor market now, what they are asking in competence and, and in experience. That's the new challenge. Just give you a figure on Sweden. Uh, when we take the portion of low-income jobs in the Swedish economy, it's now 2.5%. Average European Union is 17%. If you have a low-income part of your economy that is two and a half percent. Many of the first jobs are gone. There is no first jobs. So if you don't get your first job, how do you get your second? Uh, and that, that is our problem. So we are trying to, uh, of course, educate young people. But what we have understood is exactly what, what you said. It's not enough. Uh, it's not the right kind of skills. Um, employers are talking about social skills, looking at networks, um, asking for uh, young people to take a lot of responsibilities directly and preferably with a very low wage. Um, and, and all of this is, is coming to the young generation. So what are we trying to do? Well, first of all, uh, you need definitely to have an educational system which also takes in the part that, that you mentioned, that, that we also add on these uh, kind of skills which is not only learned 
in school, but also others. And we are, we are trying to finance these programs. Uh, we, we give coaches to young people to try to get them to increase all the so other kinds of skills, as you mentioned. We are talking to the social partners and also trade unions, trying to make a deal uh, with the social partners, saying that you can get your first job with 75% payment and 25% and education on the work which is actually partly funded by uh, government money, uh, where we give support also to the employees, because we know what the employees would do well. We don't have the time, we don't have the resources, so we need to be there and, and to support this to make it happen. It's a kind of apprenticeship, but we are trying to make it more modern. Uh, the youngsters tend to be more mobile than when you get midlife or older. So we actually, in some of the municipalities, we support buses going from one very often scarcely par, uh, populated part of the country and help them to come into another country. So I have a lot of youngsters who actually are now have a first job in Oslo in Norway where the service sector is greater and bigger and uh, gets a lot, of, a lot of Swedish youngsters a job which is not always in the place uh, in, in Sweden. We are trying to hold this but we would also need uh, actually, I'm not saying that I want a larger portion of low-income jobs because it doesn't sound very nice. But you need actually also uh, not all of these jobs being complicated directly because you will never get uh, the youngsters into the first jobs. So we are trying to see how we could actually expand. And I'm, I'm saying this with good with good uh, uh, circumstances and, and good wages, we are trying to expand the private service sector in Sweden. Then I, almost, I also await one other thing I should mention, and that we have a huge generation shift in our labour market coming, especially in the public parts of, of the labour market. Um, they tend to go very old now. So I'm, I'm a little bit worrying that they are not preparing themselves for this as if there were a lot of young people just waiting to come in and they haven't prepared themselves and I, I know that this will not really work. Um, when I look at the labour market, the industry, the big companies are sizing down, putting machines in, people out. The public sector is growing older when you look at the workforce. So. I have to look very much at the small and medium-sized businesses. There's where I get the biggest chance of getting young people in. And also, of course, new smart innovation solutions, especially among youngsters, if they can start a business of their own. All of this that I now mentioned are we trying to do. But I think it's very important to say it's not a lack of wanting to do or understanding the problem of being unemployed. It's actually something structurally that has happened with our economy, with the situation, especially in Nordic Europe, that we have never seen before. And that is why this is getting so complicated. Well, that's a great point. The entry, the first step on the job ladder is gone. Um, this question relates to uh, the skills gap story, which is very contentious. I was in one panel today, or one group of uh, participants at one Global Agenda Council, the World Economic Forum, mainly employers who were absolutely persuaded that there are many jobs out there available, but the people, particularly young people, don't have the skills to do it. It's a failure of education. Uh, I'm, there's another Global Agenda Council, which is mainly not employers. They're absolutely persuaded that that's not true, that the problem is really on the employer side. There's something the employers are not doing. Uh, I wonder what the rest of you would think about uh, this. Do you have a view on the skills gap? Maybe, Chris, I could ask you first, because you're obviously close to this as an employer. What's your sense of the skills gap problem? So the skills gap can arise be because of two things. Uh, because of the dynamic change in uh, employment and what jobs are being created by the time a person graduates. So for example, you know, graduate degree of three years or four years, you know, the job scene would have changed. And now he or she has no way of actually changing their uh, track. So that's one reason. So they got off on a losing track, it went nowhere. Went nowhere, that's <coughs> one reason. And the second um, reason is um, uh, actually not at the entry level, but at the uh, mid-level and things like that, where you, know, you have to do continuing education in order to keep up with the changes that are happening. 
um, you know, technology is rapidly changing, new tools are being deployed, uh, less number of people are sometimes required, and new jobs are being created in some other part of the organization. So who is going to retrain these people, and who is going to fund the retraining of these people? And hence, you have, a, uh, again, a skills gap challenge, because jobs are available, but you don't have the people who can take up these jobs. This is also a challenge. Yep. Anybody want to jump in on this? Yeah, um, no, I actually want to touch on that and something the minister mentioned in terms of, because I think as more uh, economies industrialize, you probably your small services sector will, or your low wage sector will shrink. And one of the startups I've worked with in the Middle East, it's called Nebish, uh, which means to look for something in Arabic. And one thing they do is they've created an online marketplace for basically anybody. You have a certain skill, and you can put that skill up online, you advertise it, and employers can start tapping into that. And I guess the whole concept of micro work is also coming in, right? Where you take the what you used to have in a factory and you put it all online and people do certain tasks. So I think there's some potential there because usually when we talk about entrepreneurship, we talk just about how the, the entrepreneur will create a job for him and other people. But there are also startups that are working exactly in that space, right? So if you have somebody that's 17, that's 16, they can start at a very young age if they're a graphic designer. I mean, I know some 10, like 10, 15 year olds that do amazing things with graphic design, with game development, with, and sometimes very simple tasks, right? And you get to accumulate that on your resume mm -hmm. so that by the time you get to these employers that are apparently demanding, mm -hmm. with their crazy demands, you can say, well, here are a couple of projects that I've contributed to. Mm -hmm. okay. Sharon, you want to jump in on this? I want to be a bit provocative and say this is a luxury discussion in my view. You know, I've worked in skills all my life, started life as a teacher and indeed uh, as a union leader in Australia always had uh, a, a place in the skills councils, etc. So don't let me mis give you the misunderstanding. I don't care about skills. I'm passionate about them and there is a misalignment. But you know, for a tiny percentage of the population, really, when the real issue is that the jobs are not there. If we were simply sitting around a table and saying, how do we align skills, then I would say to you, take it sector by sector. You know, what do we need in the retail sector to upskill? What do you need in agriculture? What's the IT uh, marriage on top of the maritime industry or whatever it is? We know how to do that. But that's not the problem overall. The problem is that you've got not enough jobs to soak up the 70 million, I think, guy, young unemployed people today, but the more than 200 million, and that doesn't pick up Chris's point about underemployment. The informal sector is growing. It's now 40% of the global economy. And indeed, in every country, it's not a north-south divide. In the G20, the informal sector, which is about desperation, people being pushed into desperate survivability incomes, is actually 20 to 90 per cent. That's in the G20 countries. So all I'm saying to you is until we start saying how do we grow the jobs, how do we get the multipliers uh, tracking that actually has employment rich multipliers associated with investment, how do we invest in infrastructure, in green jobs, in the care economy, in the things that we know work, then this is only going to take us this deep. Do you, do you have a sense, um, looking across the literature on this, as to how do you make, uh, what do you make of the skills gap story? Well, the first comment is perhaps an obvious comment, but it's worth making nonetheless, is a skills gap is a natural uh, consequence of a dynamic economy. Uh, if economy was stagnating, skills stay the same, uh, and we all just sit back and let it happen. So there's but nothing new about this, really? I don't think it's anything yeah. new, but yeah. the Prime Minister says that perhaps, and I'm quite persuaded by the argument, mm -hmm. that we're dealing, at least in the developed world, uh, with a rate of change and the nature of change which is outside our experience, and that requires us to, to develop new responses. That, you know, who's going to move? Uh, in a sense, you know, you can almost hear employers saying, I'm not saying who's on the right side of the argument, saying that we can't find the people with the right skills. What then does the enterprise do? I mean, there is a legitimate argument to say, if you need a certain skill set, you have a responsibility and a role in developing and investing in those skills. And then, as Chris has said, you, you hang on to your workers. You actually make it part of your, you know, the, the capital of your company. That's one thing. And the second side is, well, to what extent is this a responsibility of government? You know, to what extent, you know, are we investing in the right type of, not only identifying the areas in which 
educational systems need to evolve, but actually investing in educational systems to make sure that, you know, in a, in a knowledge-based economy, increasingly actually doing what we ask of them to do. Could, could I, I worry you, that everybody yeah. sits back and watches, you know, who's going to blink here? Yeah, and then we get into trouble. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great point. Can I ask you, if, if you think employees have some responsibility, individuals do, governments do, sure. um, companies, how do you split that out if you I, had to apportion it? Yeah. Of course the individual has uh -huh, responsibility, sure. and yeah. I, I go a long way in believing that activation policies are the right types of policies in mm -hmm. labour markets, further than some would go. On the other hand, I think we should be very careful of the notion that training and acquisition of skills creates its own market for yeah. those skills. It right. simply does not, right. for the reasons right. that yeah. Sharon Burrow has just pointed out. Right. Yeah. So sure there is. Uh, the individual has responsibility. Business does, the state does, mm -hmm. uh, and, and somehow the dialogue doesn't seem to produce, as I think it should, uh, the results that we would all benefit from, all of us. Mm -hmm. uh, we're about to turn to questions from the audience, and uh, while you're thinking about a good question, let me point out the reason that you're down there and we're up here. Uh, I just uh, heard that. You're sitting in a swimming pool. Uh, this was a swimming pool. It is now an auditorium. So uh, people in the front are in the deep end, those in the shallow end in the back. Uh, and if you have questions in just a second, we'll come around with some microphones. But while you're getting your hand up, Chris, maybe if I could ask you a quick one. Uh, and that is for your company, it's, uh, or, or why does it make sense for your company to hang on to employees and retrain them, given that at least in many countries of the world, including mine, this almost never happens anymore. They just churn, get rid of them, bring in a new group as soon as business turns up. Why does it work for you guys? Well, or why uh, do you do it? Why do you do it? <laughs> huh? No, well, why it works for us is because we built a financial model which includes investment into education. You know, from the beginning, uh, we saw that uh, we have to create the workforce. We cannot wait for um, you know the system to produce the workforce. So we built a business model which includes training. Uh, we have been actually working uh, with about 400 engineering colleges in India to improve the standards and things like some of the things you talked about. Uh, you know, we have a program called Campus Connect. We train teachers. We give them. Uh, our training material and things like that. And the reason why it is important in a country like India is that the societal pressure is huge. Uh, family pressure is huge. Peer pressure is very huge. And it's quite, you know, in, in a country like India, you know, the expectation on a student is very, very high. Many a time the student is actually the first student who has got a a graduate degree and things like that in their family. And so, you know, he or she is expected to um, be a breadwinner and raise the, you know, standard of living such that they escape poverty. So we have a sense of responsibility, which I think is being, uh, by and large, being recognized and, you know, okay. adhered to. Okay. We have our first question here, and you can direct it either to an individual up here or to the panel, and we'll just pick. I wanted to ask a question on policymakers and the perspective toward the creation of jobs. Um, it's my impression that often manufacturing jobs are considered the most attractive jobs to try to create in domestic markets. Um, but often the discussion, uh, perhaps as, as Ms. Burrow referenced in the green energy industry, my industry, um, unfortunately, many of the incentives created by policymakers are for manufacturing, and we all know that global corporations move manufacturing jobs when better incentives are created in other markets. So my question is, when will incentives be created systematically by policymakers to look at non-exportable jobs, as the reality in our globalized economy is often young people are being trained for jobs that in five years or in 10 years may long, no longer be in their home market? Sort of an industrial policy question. Mr. Prime Minister, what do you think? Well, I think there's been a lot of wrong decisions in, in um, pushing subsidies into old industries or manufacturing. Um, sites of different kinds. We have this history in Sweden as well. We learned that if they do not, at the end of the day, stay competitive, we can use very much of our tax money, but the job will go anyhow. So um, I think it's more important to invest in people, uh, to say that, okay, the structures may go, companies might, might fail, but we need to increase mobility and, and uh, resources uh, among people for them to be able to be employed in other parts of the, our economy. But just also, uh, because I agree with you, I think that one of the 
potentially very interesting labor markets that actually are growing is the green economy or, or the sustainable energy sector. Sweden now has 50% of the in energy consumption based on renewable energy. Uh, we have a 10 times boom when it comes to windmill power, uh, which is actually uh, now being built all over the country. It's at, at the pace where I now have protests from people saying we don't want any more wind energy now because they are so ugly. Um, so people complain about a lot of things. But still, I, I think you have a point. And we are, we are heavily subsidizing these kind, not, not to the companies in itself, but to the energy in itself. We are making the market price um, uh, compatible to using fossil fuels. And we are pushing also taxation on usage of fossil fuels. Uh, and through that, we are now reshaping uh, the energy consumption in Sweden. And it's actually creating jobs. So I agree with your point. Well, in fact, it's a, it's a really valid point because it's one of the industry sectors. We have to green every industry sector. If we're going to make the transition, that will actually save the planet. And for the unions, it's very simple. There are no jobs on a dead planet. So we actually did the research in an effort to convince governments uh, at uh, UNFCC processes, at Rio, I must say we're not making much headway, but we investigated last year 12 countries in key sectors and what it would, how many jobs it would create if you invested 2% a year in uh, green jobs for five years, and the answer in just 12 countries is 48 million new jobs. Now, you know, what could you do in 50 countries? In fact, if you look at India and China and the growth of jobs in the green economy, where they've deliberately invested in green technologies, then you see the answer. But I just want to give you a perspective that it, you know, we've got to green every job, and, uh, and I don't care what you call them, new energy jobs, green jobs, whatever. But we looked at all sectors because you actually can't provide green standards, whether it's green building standards or, uh, you know, new uh, infrastructure standards, whether it's technology on roads with smart tech tiles or whatever it is. You can't do it unless you've got supply chain that actually goes back to manufacturing. And the question really is not about, you know, having a debate about global trade, but what is it that actually sustains the ambitions around lowering the, our uh, ecological footprint? You know, when you actually build green buildings in Australia, for example, one of the most ridiculous things is we have six star, uh, six, uh, star green building standards, but we manufacture glass in Australia, but we actually were importing glass from the same company in Germany because why they put the photovoltaics often came from somewhere else in the glass there and shipped it back to Australia. That's a disaster ecologically in terms of the carbon footprint of transport. So we, do, we are going to see a much more localisation. So this is an integrated economic strategy. And while global trade will continue to exist, obviously, competition will drive it. Nevertheless, you are seeing firms and countries that are saying, well, wait a minute, we've got to join this up. So it's actually a circle economy and not simply uh, patchwork approaches to green transitions. But there are jobs, jobs and jobs there. Chris, going to follow up, but while, we could, while he's going, can we get our next question queued up in the audience? Yes, very quickly, I strongly believe that um, um, green jobs would be what internet was in the second half of the 20th century. I strongly believe that it impacts every sector and creates yeah. great opportunity for job creation. Well, we're waiting for a brave hand to go up. Chris, can I just, uh, Jamie, can I follow up with, this, uh, with you just? Oh, go ahead. Yes, ma'am, can we get a microphone? Back there? Peter, maybe, I just yeah. would love to take a crack at, at, at something that came up earlier just to see if we can join two themes in this conversation. Um, we were talking about, the, is it about the skills gap? Is it about job creation? And I'd love to see more efforts to better define the skills that are necessary for young people to be entrepreneurs Okay. And, to be, and to be productive workers. Because I think a lot of the skills are the same, and this is something we're finding, because we're doing both entrepreneurship programming and job skill matching. And a lot of the skills that employers are looking for are the same skills that young entrepreneurs need. Problem solving, creative thinking, working in teams, um, strategic um, thinking about their business. Same skills apply um, for, for employers. And it's the kind of skills that, you know, a lot of people say, well, we can't predict the, the specific technical skills five, ten years out, but there are some of those basic skills that are going to 
last a lifetime. And I just want to mention one other thing, which is that um, you know we, you, you mentioned three or four countries are dealing with this seriously. Why don't we have many more countries developing national youth employment or employment strategies with clear multi-stakeholder processes that involve government, education, business. They're making commitments. They're tracking progress on employment. And we're trying to, uh, again, model this with, uh, with our council. There's some efforts going on in Cambodia, hopefully in North Africa. But we need to see more. We need to see, we, we've got national competitive strategies. Why don't we have national youth employment strategies that bring everybody together, get shared commitments, and track progress? And I'd love to come back in 10 years to the WEF and be able to report that. Largest, that yeah. Every government needs a jobs plan. Largest if every largest. country had a jobs plan and people were committed to it, we can build our, rebuild our societies and our economies. That's, yep. that's the challenge. Sounds like the a largest lack of program, political will. Could I, largest yeah, program ahead, sure. is in India. Yep. 500 million jobs by 2020. That's right. true. Yep. true. Just qu one quick point on Jamie's uh, comment there. That's a very optimistic comment to suggest that there are common skills that all young people need to succeed in the workplace. They're also exactly the skills that most educators say people need as well. Yes, we had a question in the back. Yes, um, um, my question is um, the Federal Reserve, the U.S. Federal Reserve has a dual mandate. Their mandate is to control inflation, but the, they have an additional mandate, which is to have um, a goal of full employment. If you look at the ECB, for example, and this is an area, as everyone knows, that has one of the highest uh, unemployment rates, especially among um, the youth in, in countries like Spain, Portugal, Greece, their mandate is solely to control the inflation. So my question to the panel is, is, is it not necessary to think about resetting the goals of, of the, uh, the ECB in, in their monetary policy, not well, having it as yeah. a goal, Guy, full employment? We, we could ask you that one, Guy, but just, just to be clear, this hasn't exactly caused the US government to focus on unemployment, right? So you need probably more than just a mandate for that. Guy, what do you, what do you think? Well, uh, I'd love to think that the mandates made the difference that they should. The IMF also has within its uh, terms of, uh, terms of uh, constitution a goal to promote uh, full employment and rising living standards. Uh, you know, we don't always live 100% by our mandates. Uh, what I would say is I would uh, hesitate to get involved in the ECB's internal politics, but certainly uh, the ECB should, in whatever configuration it's working in Europe, be it in the Troika uh, with the, the IMF and, and the Commission, certainly be party to uh, policies which, when put together, give the type of priority to jobs and employment which we're hearing the unanimous view of this panel being is absolutely essential. Uh, and my experience is, and I agree with the question, uh, I don't, I'm not sure that the ECB has that on its radar screen. They could argue it's not our mandate, but they're working with others whom it certainly is within the mandate of and who have political responsibilities and expressed political commitments in that regard. So I have every sympathy with the terms of the question. Uh, I'm not sure that uh, attacking the problem in quite that manner would be the most effective, but I sympathize very much with the thought. Open for another question. Yes, sir, in the back. Ja, meine Damen und Herren, mein Name ist Werner. Ich wohne im Kura Rheintal und wir haben eine sehr interessante Diskussion heute Abend. Aber ich möchte mal ein Beispiel aus der Praxis bringen. Da war vor zwei Monaten bei uns im Rheintal ein Gärtner, er hat einen Angestellten gesucht und hat sich an die Arbeitsvermittlung gewendet. Hat jemand gefunden, der seinem Anforderungsprofil entspricht, hat ihn beschäftigt, aber nach dem ersten Tag war schon fertig, es war beendet. Am nächsten Tag hat man telefoniert und gesagt, ja warum kommt der gute Mann nicht mehr? Dann hieß es, ja so könne das ja nicht gehen, der Mann sei am Abend so müde von der Arbeit und äh, es, er, 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 es geht gar nicht mehr, er könne am Abend gar nichts mehr machen. Er geht so gerne ins Fitnessprogramm und äh, er, komm, er könne nicht mehr kommen. Er meldet sich wieder beim, bei der Arbeitsvermittlung und äh, dann hat er das Geld ja sowieso. Und dann muss man sich eigentlich fragen, ja, ist jetzt der Mann beschäftigungsunfähig oder ist unser System 
das wir hier haben, eventuell beschäftigungsunfähig. Und wenn ich jetzt auf das Plakat schaue, und da steht Looking for a Job, dann müsste es eigentlich nicht heißen Looking for a Job, sondern I want to do a job. Danke sehr. So, uh, if I could maybe rephrase uh, the question um, about individual responsibility here, conversation we started uh, before, um, how much should the individual be accountable um, for uh, the fact that they are not finding jobs or not able to keep jobs? What do we, what do we think on that? Anybody want to take a shot at that? I, mean, I, I guess just to broaden that scope, okay. I mean, the individual usually is a product of the education system and is a product of the system that produced them. And I guess that's something the gentleman hi highlighted is that maybe going back to the overall skills that Jamie highlighted around entrepreneurship, and that is discipline, showing up to work, commitment, and all that. So I think asking whose fault is it is like playing a game of football where the goal is to pass the ball instead of score. And I think here it's we're all a system. It's an ecosystem that needs to promote job creation, like we just said, but needs to also give people the skills to show up to work and to do the job well. Peter, I can also take yes, a please. crack at this. Um, so I couldn't tell from the question whether this was a, a, a young person or a, an older worker, but certainly um, in our experience with young people, it, it goes back to the question of creating these pathways and the supports that last for a while. I mean, you can't just get somebody into a job and expect them to perform a day one. You've got to have a support structure. So you've got to have some mentoring. You've got to you know, have somebody at the company, hopefully, who sits down with the person and sort of talks through how they pace themselves, how they can try to do the job without getting tired after a day, day of work. So I mean, you, anyway, the, the broader point is you need to build those systems for mentoring and coaching. And businesses are starting to do this, but I think we also need to make it easier for businesses to adopt apprenticeship and mentoring models within the companies. And it sounds like Infosys and there are other leaders that are doing that, but we need not only the job creation and the job matching, whatever it is, but we need the ongoing training and support to make people really thrive in the workforce. Well, let's maybe ask the panel that about programs like apprenticeships, which I think everyone recognizes is a terrific way to, work, to learn as you're working and to contribute uh, as you're learning um, and working your way up the organization. Certainly part of the problem might be the lower tier of those jobs are gone, but why do we think we are having as a, as a world, I think, real trouble with respect to producing enough apprenticeship programs in many countries of the world? They seem to be withering a bit. Guy, do you have a sense of that or can you help us with that? I certainly have a sense of that. Uh, you know, I'm British, my father's generation, apprenticeships were available, they were part of industrial policy, they were part of working life. When I came on the labor market, they, they practically disappeared. Uh, I know that's not the case in Germany and Austria and other countries. I think we have to rediscover, if not apprenticeships in the pure form, as I might see them in the classic form, as Prime Minister said, well, in Sweden you have things not entirely apprenticeships, but which combine elements of learning and work which may gain some financial support from, from the state to make them work. I think they're tremendous. I think it is really a time uh, to rediscover them. They work. I think the experience of those countries which have persisted with apprenticeships, I think Switzerland is also one of them, has shown that they work. Uh, and I think it's a tremendous place where this coming together of responsibilities, we've talked about the individual's responsibility. That's part of the equation, definitely. But also the partnerships between, um, between businesses, and I think there is a real thought amongst many businesses, I hear it, mm -hmm. that they feel that they have a role in this area. Mm -hmm. uh, the state, of course, and uh, uh, organized labor as well. Mm -hmm. The trade unions have a very important role in regulating the manner in which apprenticeships mm -hmm. and this type of scheme uh, are operated. They can have pitfalls. Mm -hmm. It's important that there's a strong consensus in industry about how they should operate. That way they're more effective. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us a little about the Swedish experience with this? They're probably under pressure in some ways in Sweden as well. Well, I agree to the description. We have not um, had that kind of success with the apprenticeship program. I've actually been here in Switzerland looking at a much more effective and uh, successful apprenticeship uh, schemes that you are having in this country. Uh, also, uh, as mentioned, in Germany, and I was also say Denmark. So we have countries where, where this is actually a, a part of their model. <clears throat> why, why is that? not the case in, in, in Sweden. Well, um, to be frank, I think many of the companies in their strive at being more effective also have said that we haven't got the resources or the time for the apprenticeship either. Uh, it's, it's, it's not very 
um, much, uh, not an example of good leadership and uh, I don't understand how they foresee the future of their companies and then the problem might be that apprenticeship is very much linked to bigger companies. In my country much of the bigger companies have actually been downsizing, not employing new people. Uh, the new people have come into new companies which very often are very small, just one or two um, in small companies and they cannot bear apprenticeship schemes. So this is also part of the explanation. Uh, I think it, it, you have to have some resources in a company and be quite big to be able to have apprenticeship and a lot of investments in your employers and give them give you themselves the time needed. But again, as I mentioned, we are trying to do our part with our social partners talking about uh, what we call a job pact, which is exactly what I mentioned, 75% salary, 25% education uh, with uh, support. And we also have other schemes because, uh, as I mentioned, we see this as one of the main factors to increase employability uh, among the young. To get them in, we, we, to, to show themselves, to be able to say that I'm, I'm not perfect the first day or the first week and that you give me some time to learn on the job training, all of these things you need to take care of if you want to tackle uh, youth unemployment of today. Mm -hmm. Sharon, in many parts of the world unions carry most of the apprenticeship programs and I think the economic reason for this is the participants pay off the apprentice program the rest of their life with their dues, that they, they stay attached to the union even if they leave one employer or another. What's happened in the union the, sector? There's with many them? different models. Yeah. That okay. is a model that exists in some places. Other models are tripartite models. Other models are business and labour. Mm -hmm. But what is clear is it works. Mm -hmm. It actually works. It is about inclusion. And there was, uh, there is a challenge to kind of look at what has worked and let's renew it by all means. But these key elements of apprenticeship are inclusion, they are about mentoring, they are about qualifications based, and they are about a mixture of work and education. And, uh, and one of the things that we have called for jointly as business and labour, from the, the business and labour community associated with, the, with the, the G20, is the scaling up of apprenticeships. We need to make sure that they are, of course, uh, inclusive of uh, uh, women, young women as well, because too, too often in the last uh, few decades the, they've become traditional male apprenticeships because we've put, uh, for good reason, the courses like nursing and so on into universities as they've been upskilled. But we need to go back to those models because while you're creating jobs, you can include people. And one of the failings, why, why this has dissipated in part, is if you look at... Uh, the, uh, the amount that business, and you know, it's terrific to have Chris here with a different perspective. Every business, public or private sector businesses, would in fact invest in apprenticeships. Yes, there's some government subsidies. Yes, we uh, do training wage awards by, uh, you know, kind of uh, collective bargaining with unions and so on. But the amount spent now in structured training by business has taken a dive in the last 15 years. In fact, I was looking at some figures, Guy, you'd put out uh, just this week where, you know, productivity uh, investments in workers has fallen by something like 1% or thereabouts. It used to be over 2% on average and now it's... Uh, so 1% one, 1 of total labour costs? Well, I'm not sure figure? actually because yeah. I only saw the headline figures, but I can tell you them by country. Okay. There are, in fact, it's much bigger than that in some countries. But if, if the productivity uh, fall in investments, in a worker has fallen from over 2% globally to 1.8 or something, then you've got a serious amount of money that is not going in by business investing in their own sustainable futures. And of course, it's all about attacking secure jobs as well. Work is now so insecure. The short-term contract, the churn that's there. I don't know, frankly, how businesses survive on the bottom line when they can't retain skills. So again, smart businesses are going to continue to invest. I just want to give the, um, the Prime Minister a little tip. There are models that actually support apprenticeships in small to medium enterprise. Group training companies, whatever you might call them, where they actually employ the young people but they spend time in different uh, small to medium em enterprises, again supported by business, labour and indeed subsidies, not-for-profit um, ventures, I might say, 
these things work and people get the mentorship that you're talking about. So I can only say that investing in, in jobs is our key priority, but inclusion in the labour market has to be a responsibility for all of us, not the young person alone, but all of us, if we want to build decent societies where we give our children and grandchildren purpose and opportunity. Okay. Another question back, back there, one here, please. Maybe we could get a microphone back okay. to the question there, so we're ready. Yeah. Sorry. Okay, uh, I had a, a question. Uh, well, coming from the discussion, uh, uh, from the analysis that f about, from about 100, or maybe 200 years ago, we all came from co uh, countries which had a large of a part of the population working in agriculture, and now moving to in, through the whole industrial re revolution, now into uh, maybe a new area, but a lot of discontinuity and a lot of uh, anxiety about uh, how are we going to progress to various crises. Um, uh, I remember a couple of years ago I had a talk with an, an architect who came from Iraq and especially around the area, around the time when they had a lot, the biggest turmoil of uh, their system being overthrown. Uh, the thing that scared him the most was that there were a lot of people unemployed in, in his area. Um, which led to a lot of people uh, going into all kinds of military factions, which caused probably a large part of terrorism and all the turmoil. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's one thing that I haven't really heard much about in the panel now, is the, um, the, um, the effect that, that you have, when, like in Spain, when you have 40% of young people or even more unemployed, is where, where is Spain going? Mm -hmm. So maybe we can pursue that maybe with Jamie and Nafez in, in your parts of the world where you're working. Somebody at the conference here was indicating that every major conflict in modern times was precipitated by young male unemployment rates greater than 30%. Uh, what's your feel about it in, in your parts of the world? I, mean, I guess so. I mean, I come from the Middle East and the Arab Spring is still a common phenomenon. And I guess looking at Egypt, one of the examples, and I guess this is one of the statistics that really got me to think about really education reform. So 98% of PhD graduates in Egypt at some point were unemployed, right? So actually specifically in Egypt, I think, and I might, the data might have changed, uh, I guess the guy would know, is that the more educated you are, the, or, the more unemployed you are. So there's this whole oh. social contract where you give somebody the tools and you give them this false promise, and when that false promise doesn't get uh, realized, we've seen what the agitation creates, right? And the region right now in the Middle East, we have the highest youth unemployment rate in the world as a region. And that is creating a lot of the instability all over the region. Mm -hmm. Jim, you want to jump in and then we'll... I mean, yeah, I mean, you've got to, you got to give young people something to do. I mean, you've got to get them productive, either in school, getting educated, or in the workforce, or giving them some other opportunity to, to start a business or, or get, um, you know, I, I have a, a board member who um, was a, a cabinet secretary and she said, you know, if young people are left alone too long, they're going to get into trouble in whatever society. So um, I think it's incredibly important to provide job opportunities in any of these societies to give people the hope and dignity of work. I mean, that is something that resonates for all of us working in this, in this area, that work is one of the grounding elements of human dignity. It's um, by far the, the top concern in Gallup's polling um, worldwide year after year. In the Middle East, jobs before the Arab Spring were a top priority, and they're still a top priority. I mean, that does not change. It's a, it's a common theme. Um, and I, I'd love to just ask one, one question to some of our expert policymakers that, that Naf has brought up before, which is we haven't talked much about the changing definition of work. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of discussion about meaningful work and inclusion, but Naf has brought up a really good point that we're seeing. It's, it, there's a lot more sort of project-based work, technology-based work, um, do we need to start think, rethinking policies to allow more flexible work arrangements where young people are um, connected on the internet, um, doing project-based work, uh, getting some safety net, but not necessarily the expectation of a nine to five salaried job for a company that's going to last for 20, 30 years. As, most peop as you all know, most of the jobs created are not by big companies and they don't last a, a lifetime. Yeah. They're small companies. 
yeah. people change careers now seven, 10, 15 and times in their it, lifetime. Implicit in anybody's answer is whether we think this is a good thing or, and whether it, if it's not a good thing, whether it could actually be diverted or whether we're kind of stuck with it, right? Does anybody want to take a quick stab at that and then we'll get to the, or why don't we yeah, get I, you to follow up on youth unemployment then we'll come back to that. No, I just wanted to, 1% of the um, population of Sweden is of Iraqi origin, 1%. So a lot of the people leaving the wartime, especially the war between Iran and Iraq, ended up in far north in Sweden, 100,000 of them. Nearly an extra percent is actually from Iran. Um, so I think don't forget the question of mobility throughout the world and that we also stand open to other societies in time of crisis. When I left Sweden this morning, my main news uh, newspaper in Stockholm was headed by now the Spaniards and the Greeks are coming to Sweden. Uh, so we have now a huge increase in people coming from Mediterranean countries searching for a job in Scandinavia and in my country. And we stand open to that. That is also a part of helping this problem. I don't think you can create anything on your own. Sometimes you actually need to be mobile and also other countries need to be open. And uh, longer term, a huge issue with exploding birth rates in the Middle East, in North Africa, and uh, declining birth rates uh, here in Europe. Right? Oh, so exactly. we want to take a, a quick uh, stab at Jamie's uh, question here, which was about uh, changing nature of work. Anybody have a feel as to whether we ought to accommodate it or block it? Or what do you think? Yeah? I guess, uh, so we were with uh, Muhtar Kent, the uh, CEO of Coca-Cola yesterday, and he said even as a company, and I guess he said collectively with their bottlers and everything, they employ 700,000 people. Mm -hmm. They were already thinking about how this whole nature of work needs to change, right? And if you look at uh, employers with the largest satisfaction, Google, all the San, uh, San Francisco tech scene, a lot of them have changed this definition, right? There's no more time to it. You come in and it's based, you're graded or you're evaluated on what you produce, not how long you work and how long that takes you, right? Because different people like to work at different times. And I guess especially for, I guess the younger generation, one thing I'm not noticing about my colleagues is people have a much more flexible definition of where they'd like to work and how they'd like to work. So I definitely I think, think I we're think speaking moving. as an older person, I could say we have the same interests. We just couldn't get employers to do it for us, right? So, uh, let's maybe we move. But, 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 yeah, yeah, sorry. I'll just need to put okay. this in perspective because all of that's true and we've always accommodated changes in the nature of work. You know, there was a time when women didn't participate in work, largely because they couldn't manage work and family. You know, we've found ways to accommodate that with both the care economy, childcare, secure part-time work, you know, time out of the workforce, you know, men increasingly being part of the caring environment within sense. So, you know, but this is again a luxury. Let me tell you about Qatar, 1.2 million people, migrants, building the state of Qatar, working in slave labour conditions. Why? Because there are no jobs in their own country. Do the Nepali young men want to be in Qatar or the domestic workers want to be there from India or the Philippines? No. They want to be with their families. But there are no jobs. And so when we talk about, you know, this end of the spectrum, of course we have to be, you know, intellectually interested and find the solutions for changing patterns of work. But most workers, only change their destination of work out of desperation. You know, we talk about global mobility. I'm globally mobile, many of you are, but most people don't leave more than about 10 kilometres from their villages. So let's not make policy only for the small number. Let's actually look at the world in reality because what we are about is that sense of purpose, the dignity of labour, that underpins communities. So I'm not saying these things are wrong to think about, but I don't want people to think that if we solve those problems, which are intellectually challenging and interesting, we'll have actually built sustainable communities that have the dignity you were talking about. We're getting very close to the end. We have a couple more hands up. Could we get short questions, and I hope short answers, to make sure we get them all in? So there was a question, I think, in the back. A microphone there, yes, sir. Yeah, uh, we've talked a lot about the consequences of youth unemployment globally. Um, but I'm wondering why you think uh, this is such a hard problem for governments to deal with and which governments are dealing with it well, if any. Okay. Touched on that a little bit before, but um, anybody want to take a shot at it? Well, I don't think it's a hard problem. I just think we need political will. I think it is a hard problem, and we need political will. <laughs> <laughs> 
And that's the social dialogue mix, you know? <laughs> yeah. uh, we have uh, our next hand up. Uh, here, down here in front. Yes, sir. Good evening. My name is Robert Stewart. I'm from Canada. I've run uh, telecom companies and 15 years ago introduced a technology called Voice Over the Internet Protocol. Uh, that allows 2 billion people today to talk around the world, to create employment, to create trade, investment, savings. And uh, uh, it's led, it was led by the Nordic countries, uh, by Asia, uh, in the manufacturing process. I hope I can report in two years' time that a new technology I will be introducing this year will allow people to make transfers of cash to create um, uh, wealth, uh, to invest in, in themselves and their friends, and to bank it uh, on cell phones. And knowing that billions of young people today use cell phones around the world, I'm going to reduce the cost of that to about 1% of what it is today. It worked for VoIP. I hope it works for this. I hope it's a solution to end the discussion on tonight. It might help. Good. So a point about uh, infrastructure, yeah, for entrepreneurship. Yes, sir. He needs a microphone. Um, hi, I'm a professor at uh, New York University, so I've been listening very carefully to the discussions. You're uh, among friends. Today. I am, um, <laughs> exactly. Um, so one of the things that I often hear from people who have real work, unlike professors, is that they are overworked. So we have a whole bunch of folks, I'm sure many of them in this room, who claim they are overworked. Yeah. They're doing the jobs of three people. Yeah. Well, why don't they go out and employ two more? Uh, is what I don't understand. So that's my first question. My second question is, why are universities run by administrators and not by students? Uh, students should run them. Uh, they need jobs. We have lots of work for them. Uh, they could run a credit union. There is a very good university in the United States in which the entire credit union, including lending decisions, are made by students. So why don't the students acquire the necessary uh, work by actually working at the enterprise which is supposed to train them. And my last thought is that when universities are unable to place their students, uh, are we creating defects? Uh, are we in fact admitting way too many people because we have empty seats and we know full well that we are going to be unable to employ them well after four uh, years of university? I think many parts there. I think a guy sort of answered the first one, supply doesn't, we shouldn't expect supply to create its own demand, right? Um, and there's an interesting question, though, particularly in law schools right now, which charge a lot of money. People are graduating without uh, jobs, but I think it's hard for the universities to guarantee jobs, right, since nobody else seems to be able to do that either. Uh, your first point, I, I, I forgot the first part, so maybe uh, See, one, Chris could jump one, in. Yeah, one of the reasons why people feel they're overworked is they have to learn and do uh, because of the constant change uh, we are saying. And second is severe competition. So you are expected, you know, the expectation levels have gone up of what is performance, I think. Uh, and, 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 and that puts a lot of stress and strain actually on the individual. But, but that's unfortunately caused by the competition that has been created now. You know, if you hold on to a job, Know, you have to make sure that you do everything possible to continue to hold on. And just a quick comment. I, I do. There's always this discussion about, about accountability. Who's accountable for, you know, um, young people getting into the job market with the right skills, et cetera. And I do think that universities and schools have to start feeling accountable for the next step. Traditionally, as 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 you know, they're accountable for graduation rates. They need to be accountable for what happens after graduation. And I think that's starting to to change. And it's not them alone, but uh, I'd love to see schools starting to judge their success by where their graduates end up, and some do, but a lot don't. Just a brief caveat to that, though. We also have a problem of creeping um, vocationalism. Uh, so master's degrees in my town, there's a school that offers a master's degree in pharmaceutical marketing. Um, you know, we're getting so narrow uh, that it actually puts people at risk if you don't get a job in that context. Uh, we're about to wrap up here. If I could ask the panel very briefly, put you all on the spot if you had one point that you could with your magic wand get uh, the appropriate policy people to accept uh, what would it be one point that you'd like to stick in their mind what would it be and anyone who's prepared could go first well I'll go first we want governments to have a jobs plan and we want the social partners to sit down and figure mm -hmm. that out and can I just acknowledge the innovator here because I don't think you got acknowledged, but before Christmas we had 
a massive fight with governments and old business models who wanted to, to actually control the internet and put pricing policies on VoIP and so on. So keep the good work going, but a jobs plan supported by that kind of investment in infrastructure and we're in business. Okay, Chris? So, um, you know, we do budgeting uh, in companies, we do budgeting in governments, etc. I think it's equally important to do a, a manpower plan of forecasting, which is not, you know, one year or two years, but five years or ten years out. Because it is, you know, it takes that much time actually to prepare people. Uh, you know, you're not, you know, creating widgets. You have to create, you know, a, a person who can, who's capable of doing a particular job. I think that's very, very important to do that long-term planning for people. Okay. Okay. Youth guarantees, I, I think, uh, soak up this, this appalling reservoir of the, the knee, knee that you mentioned, the Spanish phrase, neither in employment, neither in training. That's the lost generation in, in formation, as I put it earlier on. Youth guarantee schemes, learn from Sweden, learn from Finland and others. Well, I, I think it's very important. I mean, we, we call ourselves sometimes the rich world or the rich countries, but these rich countries are highly indebted. Uh, so they are rich and poor at the same time. And China owns everything. Um, <laughs> and I, I'm just mentioning this because this idea that I just have to sign a paper and then it's solved, um, that is not reflecting the problem as it is. It's not just to take a decision to employ everyone. Uh, we have a public sector, we have a private sector, we need a balance, we need to be able to finance jobs with good wages that cost. I have to ask for taxes from people to be able to actually fund that. That is the balance we have to strike. Um, then, it's, then it's when it, ge it gets complicated and we are already highly indebted. I would uh, direct investments uh, to the educational system and we are doing so. I think, and, and then I mean every child should have a better education, better support early in life, because that's probably the best way to deal with a lot of these problems. Um, I guess just to follow up on what the Prime Minister said, an emphasis on mentorship, because poverty isn't just about a lack of resources, it's about a lack of access to people that can help you make more of yourself, right? So you need those people to guide you through those transitions, to tell you what's needed at every stage, so more mentorship, that would be my okay. message. Okay. I might have uh, said Sharon's point, but I would also love to see, we are now acknowledging a global crisis with employment and youth employment, youth unemployment in particular. And um, as we've done in healthcare and other areas where we've put together big global funds and, and consortia to tackle, you know, malnutrition, disease, I'd like to see a global fund for employment and resources that are really invested in um, uh, drawing down the, the rate of unemployment globally in addition to the country plans. And that kind of global consortia, um, I think, could you know, have, have the seeds in a place like Davos. I think we're at the end of our time here. Please uh, join me in thanking our panel for, I think, a very frank, uh, interesting, and enlightening discussion. Thank you all.